everyone. Thanks for joining us. Everyone's coming into the room. We'll give each, each other some time to, to get settled. Great. Wonderful. Hello, my name is Courtney Waring with the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art. Thank you for joining us for our Translating Picture Books webinar. Before I hand it off to our co-host, Regina Galasso, who will be introducing our moderator today, I just have a few things to share. First, we love to hear from you. We wanna know where you're connecting from. So feel free to use the chat button to say hi and where you're connecting from. And you might wanna check out that chat uh, feature uh, throughout the program. We might be adding some links to share with you. And please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions during the program, we'll have time at the end for our panelists to respond to those. If we experience any technical difficulties and we get cut off, fingers crossed that won't happen, we'll try to get back online as soon as possible and you could use the link shared in your Zoom reminder to reconnect. This program is being recorded. So if you miss any part or would like to share with a friend or colleague, we should have it on the Carl's YouTube page next week. And I'll now hand us over to Regina Galasso, Associate Professor and Director of the Translation Center at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thanks, Regina. Well, um, thank you, Courtney. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am in, um, one of the curators of the book exhibition, Read the World, Picture Books and Translation. And um, the exhibition is going to close on um, May 1st, so I just want to take this opportunity to send a huge thank you to Courtney, David, the Eric Carle Museum, Amherst College, and all the others who support and visit Read the World. We love receiving your comments and hearing about your experience, and I um, want to give a special shout out to Lori at mykidsreadtheworld.wordpress.com for recently reviewing the exhibition in a blog post on her site. Thank you so much for that. And um, please everyone check it out. Um, so Read the World highlights the role of translators, showcases multilingual books, and introduces readers to recent English translations and their publishers. The exhibition has three parts, meet translators, see languages, and expand the story. It includes over 40 books, and in addition, we created educational materials, um, including a guide for experienced readers to discuss translation with young readers and activities for children to better understand and appreciate how translation works. So why, as a university class, did we do this? Um, the short answer is that we did this to bring more attention to translators and translation. We collectively agreed that many readers of all ages, when they think about books, don't always include translators on the list of people who help make books. So we want to change that. And um, without translators, we would only be able to read the languages we know um, and, and, and um, that means we really only have access to ideas that were created by people who know the languages that we know. And we agreed that thanks to translators, translated books help us to get to know the world ourselves, and they inspire us to learn new things, including languages. Um, so some readers, some young readers at the campus school of um, Smith College in Massachusetts sent us a question of um, related to the exhibit. And their question is, why isn't there more attention paid to translators? In the picture books we've been reading, their names don't show up on the cover like the author illustrator. Thank you for this question, campus school students. Um, it is excellent and the response has many parts. Um, the translators that you're about to meet are going to help us answer this question. And um, Niños, Poems for the Lost Children of Chile, a book by Maria Jose Ferrada with illustrations by Maria Elena Valdez, published by Erdman's Books for Young Readers and translated from uh, Spanish to English by Lauren Schimmel, one of our translators here today, just won the 2022 Patterson Prize for Books for Young People. Was his name mentioned in the award announcement? No. 
So please listen carefully to the translators during today's presentation. And at the end, ask yourself, do you think more attention should be paid to translators? Why or why not? And if you agree, how can you make that happen? And please, please send me your ideas. So since every book in our exhibition has a translator, we thought, how can we put a brighter spotlight on the role of the translator? And we came up with a solution to have one section called Meet Translators to feature four translators who have translated a notable number of picture books from one language um, for, or from some language into English. Um, and we're so fortunate that they agreed to be here today. And before Gussie introduces you to them, I um, would, and before I introduce you to Gussie, I, I want to ask you to just do two things to help us continue the, um, to spread the messages of Read the World. And one is to please use the resources we've created. They're on the Eric Harrell website. Um, there you have the book list and, and the exhibition text. You have two activities in English, Chinese, Japanese, um, Korean, and Spanish. And um, there are two other resources we have that are only available in the reading library. If you don't get to the reading library to get them, um, contact us and, and we will send them over to you. And the second thing you could do is to create your own version of Read the World. Um, you can use the exhibition text to create your own three-part book ex exhibit in your homes, classrooms, libraries, and bookstores. And you can use the books you already have um, or use it as an opportunity to see what kinds of picture books in translation you need to add to, to your own collection and, and maybe come up with a, a fun way to get those books. So that's what I, those are two things I, I ask you to do. Um, and now I am going to introduce you to Augusta Weiss, who will be asking the translators the questions that, that we've received um, from you for them. And Gussie is one of the student curators of Read the World. She has worked in early education at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and Amazing World of Dr. Seuss Museum. And she became impassioned to question how adults can empower children. She has conducted over 400 hours of picture book research centered on child agency with a focus on the semiotics of image and text. And she is currently a junior at Amherst College, majoring in art and the history of art and Spanish. And she is also the creator of two educational resources that I already mentioned. One is called Using Picture Books to Discuss Translation with Young Readers. And the other is called Take a Closer Look. It's an activity that helps readers think about how reading a book in translation is different from reading one written in English. And these are brilliant resources. Thank you, Gussie, for creating them, for your commitment to our work together, and for joining us today. And um, over to you, Gussie. Thank you so much for that introduction and for having me with you guys today. Um, as Professor Galasso said, I was one of the students collaborating to curate this exhibition. Um, so today we're going to be talking with our four translators we featured in the Meet Translators section, um, who I'll introduce briefly before we start speaking with them. Um, Ruth Ahmed Zykemp is a literary translator working from Arabic, German, and Russian into English. She translates fiction and nonfiction with a particular interest in history, historical fiction, and writing for children and young adults. Ruth co-edits three blogs about translation, children's literature, um, and children's literature, which are called World Kid Lit, Arab Kid Lit Now, and Russian Kid Lit. She is an active champion of world literature for children, especially in September, which is Kid, World Kid Lit Month. Daniel Hahn, um, our second translator is an award-winning writer, editor, and translator with some 80 books to his name. His translations include fiction and nonfiction for adults and children, um, and he works from Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Lawrence Schimmel writes in both Spanish and English and also translates in both directions. 
His translations into English have won a highly commended award in the 2020 Center for Literacy and Primary Poetry Award, a Penn Translates Award from English Penn twice, and a National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowship, among other honors. He was one of the original founders of World Kid Lit Month and lives in Madrid. Helen Wong is a UK-based translator and promoter of Chinese children's books into English. Her translations include picture books and middle grade novels, and she works collaboratively with World Kid Lit, the lead center for Ch new Chinese writing, Paper Republic, and other groups. And in 2016, she started the blog site Chinese Books for Young Readers with children's literature scholar Minjie Chen and translator Anna Gustafsson Chen. So, um, as we said, we'll be speaking with those translators for the beginning of the session, and then at the end there will be time for a Q&A, so please do send in any questions that come up um, and come to mind as we're speaking with our translators. Um, so first we wanted to ask you about becoming a translator, um, what inspired your interests in translation, and more specifically in translating picture books. Um, from the students at the Campus School of Smith College that Regina mentioned. Um, they would like to know how long does it take to become a translator and what kind of school do you have to go to? Um, so we are thinking we would start with you, Daniel. Um, pass it over. Thanks, Gussie, and hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Um, I sort of started working in translation kind of by accident. I didn't know I was interested in translation until someone asked me to do a bit of translating and it turned out to be incredibly fun. But I sort of, alongside that, was working in children's books, writing about children's books and interviewing children's writers. But for quite a long time, I was doing those things separately. So being a translator a bit and working with children's books a bit. And I didn't get the opportunity to translate a picture book until I'd been doing both of those things for quite a long time. But there was a publisher called Emma Langley who gave me the opportunity to translate my first picture book uh, probably about 10 years ago now. And it was uh, one of the most fun jobs I have ever done. And ever since it's the thing that I most, that I've most wanted to do. Um, there isn't, as some of you will know, we don't publish very much uh, work in translation for, for children. The number of picture books in translation that are published in English are quite small. And so there's never quite enough work, there's never as much work as I want. I think if there were, I mean, I would do nothing else. I would just translate picture books from morning till night if I had, if there was enough of it. Um, that, that last bit of the question, Gussie, I think is quite an interesting one about um, kind of how long it takes to become a, a, a translator and, um, and what kind of school you have to go to. And one way of answering that question is, um, it doesn't take any time at all. You can just do it, anyone who, is, has you know, a little bit of understanding of more than one language and is interested in stories can try doing it. Um, being like a published translator and working with publishers and that kind of thing is a, is a, is a different, uh, is a sort of different problem. But translation I think should be something that anybody of any age, whatever kind of school they go to or went to, should feel like they should be able to, to try. It's a, kind of, it's a kind of playing, I think, and everyone should be allowed to play. Thank you for that. Um, if anyone has other thoughts to add, please. I'll add a thought to that, is that sometimes you come across small children who want to pretend that they can read, but actually they can't read and they'll pick up a picture book and they'll just read it. And the story may be completely different from what the words say, but they're reading the book and they're, basically they're they're reading it they're translating it they're making it work for them by following the pictures and roughly whether there are a lot of words on the page and not a lot of words on the page and I think that's actually quite it's quite an informative way of thinking about doing the translation as to how how you approach it whether you're scared of the words or whether you just jump in as Daniel said and uh, and get on with it I think I mean there's also wordless books. And I mean, one of the things that's very different about picture books than other types of translation is you have this mm, coexistence of, you have both a, a visual narrative as well as the, the text narrative, and both of them are equally important in a picture book. And so, but, you know, I just also wanted to mention reading. And I think that the best way to become uh, a translator of picture books is to read picture books in, 
English as well as in the other languages that you want to be translating from. And so I remember I worked at um, a children's bookstore in New York many, many years ago. And the first day on the job, um, I had to read a hundred picture books. That was all that I did all day long. And I was paid to sit down and read books um, so that when people came in, I could recommend both you know, the classics and the staff favorites and also new picture books. And that was an amazing um, and important thing. And I think that it's important for, um, for translators to be reading in the language that they're translating into as well to see the conventions of picture books, the language that's used in picture books, um, and also that we can have an effect or, you know, effect change in what's going on in picture books as well as a result of knowing what's out there already. Can I just um, add, that going back to the question about education and sort of routes to becoming a translator, um, it's important to see that there's lots of different kinds of translators and, and to, to work in like the business setting or um, um, uh, more like legal, those sorts of translations, um, then you might need a qualification. But for publishing, it's actually very rare for a translator to have a qualification or, or um, you don't, it's more about proving that you can write and that you know you know books <laughs> so it's more about having publishing experience and or if you don't have that publishing experience then then finding it so doing research working at talking to booksellers you know, reading everything that you can come across to get to know the kinds of books that you want to translate and I was I'm, I'm unusual that I, I did train as a translator because I originally saw myself actually as an interpreter and as a kind of um, mediator between people using my languages in a spoken way um, so that's interpreting and I quite quickly realized I'm not very good at that. And actually I'm much more comfortable with books. So it was a gradual shift to becoming a text translator or a book translator. But um, actually I don't think I could have translated picture books until I was a mum. And it was reading books every day, every night with my kids that made me think, this is what I love. I love reading. I love, I love you know, um, storytelling and, and reading books aloud. But it was wanting to find more diverse books for my children to encourage them to see the world in its sort of multilingual, uh, multifaceted way that, 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 that I'm so interested in. And it was wanting that, that experience of my children that made me sort of start looking into children's books more as, a, as something that I could translate. Thank you. Um, a lot of you were touching on the picture book structure and what, why you were drawing a picture book specifically. So we were also hoping to ask specifically about what it means to translate picture books. Um, we have a question from Patricia Billings, who is an author, publisher, wisdom worker, mindfulness guide and advocate, um, and outside in world trustee. She visited our class, um, the class that I worked with in fall 2021 as we were planning the exhibition. Um, so she was supporting us along the way. Um, and she sent us the following question. With translated picture books, I'm always interested in how they can expand visual vocabularies or visual literacies for readers. When translating picture books, how do you think the interaction between the text and the pictures, how the image translate along with your text as you're delivering a composite multi-sensory experience? And what are some of the challenges in this respect? If and how do the art and design of the source material influence your decisions when translating picture books? So we are hoping to start back with you, Ruth, um, if you. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, something to consider here is that um, there's lots of different kinds of picture books, of course, for lots of different ages, there's fiction, nonfiction. And around the world, there's many different styles of picture books, which we are perhaps not so familiar with in, in the UK market or even in the US market. So the format can be, can be quite challenging in itself. And um, this is one example of a, a book, uh, which you've, I'm holding upside down, <laughs> which you've got in um, the exhibition. I've got the Arabic version, um, Nora's Escape. And it's a, an example of a picture book where there's a lot of words. It's very long, it's quite a long text. Um, and that was in itself a challenge of thinking, do we reduce that? Does it matter? Um, but then it was also a challenge um, in terms of um, translating the illustrations because um, it's about um, Noor who um, effectively is homeless. She's very hungry. She's trying to 
it's about her trying to escape from her reality and what the, that process is of being a refugee and of, of, of moving, having agency somehow to sort of move from a difficult reality. Um, and one of the pictures is of the, the birds in her tummy tweeting. And that's a very common phrase in Arabic. We say, it means that your tummy is rumbling. And it's actually shown in the illustration. And that was so hard to know what to do with that because I couldn't say my tummy was grumbling, my tummy was rumbling, growling, because obviously birds don't growl <laughs> or rumble. And it's just a very different um, way of thinking about hunger. Um, so on the one hand, it was tempting to sort of um, uh, downplay that or not draw attention to it. But then of course, kids are gonna say, think, why are there birds in this picture? And that is in itself a kind of a form of um, visual literacy, isn't it? Expanding the idea of like the ways that we can think about hunger in our bodies. So I actually don't remember, I haven't got a copy of the English, so I can't remember what I finally went with. But if I translated it again, I think I would go with chattering. They tell me the scattering, something like that. Mm. But this um, is, is never, I, I always feel like not just my decision, and it was something I really enjoyed talking about with the editor, with the author, thinking what's the best thing to do here. But it's a constant conundrum and a puzzle, and that's what's fun about it. Oops. I can jump in if, um, so, this was one of the images that people may have seen announcing this event. This is from a book I translated called, in English, the translation is called The Day Saida Arrived. And actually, this can be something that's very interesting how the original Spanish edition has a very different image on the cover. So right away, um, decisions were made um, just on, on the publishing level of what is the best image to, um, to actually show this book. But also, you know, you can see that the words are so physically part of the illustration here. So in this case, the illustrator had to actually redraw um, this page. These were the original illustrations. And here you have the new uh, with the English version that I had translated. So, you know, on, very often on a physical level, that has to happen as well. And that's something that, you know, translators have to keep in mind. Um, you know, we have to be attentive to visual things that we may need to translate. I mean, this is a, a picture book of mine um, as an author, not as a translator um, that was published in Brazil uh, with a Brazilian artist, Tiago Lopez. And so you can see that there are details from his, um, his Sao Paulo neighborhood. So it, the no parking sign has an E instead of a P because it's no estacionar in Portuguese. And so for the, the English translation, this for instance was published in Singapore um, they had to actually change the art to make it a P for no parking so that that would be recognizable because kids in English speaking world wouldn't recognize that that was a no parking. Um, so uh, I think also the biggest problem or the biggest thing that translators have to keep in mind with illustrated uh, works though is especially if you're translating something that rhymes, you have to, very often you have to change things so that it works in the language you're translating into and you can't ever contradict what's shown in the, in the art. And so very often you, you wind up making or taking certain liberties with the text, but in order to be more faithful to the picture book as a whole of the text and you know, both narratives have to work together. I, I find myself quite often thinking about my job as being translating the, the story that the pictures are telling. Um, and the, the, the words that are there in the original might be useful guidance, but that's often the thing that I am fastest to jettison. Because as you say, Lawrence, that it has to work as a kind of unified thing. Um, you can't you just take the other words out, translate them and dump some new words in and assume it's going to, assume it's going to work. Sometimes, as you say, that there'll be words in the kind of incorporated the pictures that need translating, that needs, you know, re-lettering and stuff. Um, I have on occasion, uh, I was going to say made illustrators change things, but asked delicately and humbly asked illustrators to change things specifically to suit a translation for one reason or another. Um, but as Lawrence was saying, that often you find that the, the pictures become a kind of constraint. And you think, well, I'd like to change. I had one book which was all about watermelons, and I had for various reasons I would have loved it to be about something that was not a watermelon, but unfortunately, 
there were pictures of watermelons on every page. And short of throwing the entire book away and starting again with new pictures, that the, the pictures become the kind of limiting factor. But I think it also something about this goes back to what Lauren said at the very beginning about sitting down with lots and lots and lots of picture books and just reading them. Because I think one of the things you also want to do is have some understanding of, of essentially how picture books work. And sometimes it's more complicated than just, you know, there are some words telling a story and there are some pictures that are kind of, that are illustrating it or that are ornamenting it. But often the relationship between the two is much more dynamic. Maybe it's in conflict. Maybe there's a reason why the text and the pictures are doing different things or doing, uh, doing things at different times. Um, so I think some understanding of, you know, picture books are a form um, and some understanding of the possibilities of that form. Um, depends entirely on being able to see how the pictures are operating and what the relationship between between those two things are. Um, in my case, I'll maybe give an example of uh, something I was asked to translate last year, which was, I think it was a set of about four picture books about a donkey. And I was asked, so would I translate these four picture books about four stories about a donkey? And could I do it very fast, please? And I said, well, where are the pictures? Oh, we haven't got the pictures yet. And I just said, I'm sorry, I can't do this because I can't translate the story, the picture book without the pictures. It just wouldn't work. Another project that I did well, many years ago was a story. The story depended upon the little boy who was born in the countryside and he was born with three arrows, arrow marks on his skin. And the three arrow marks indicated that he was uh, maybe of the imperial family or he was... He was going to take over the world, something like this. But nowhere in this book was a picture of the, of the marking on the skin. And so my children are grown up now, but you know, the first thing my children would have said, well, where are, the, where are the marks on the skin? This isn't the right boy. It just doesn't work. And so sometimes it, it's a question of the, if there is a mis, if, if the illustrations have been done on one, by one person and the text has been done by somebody else and there's been no communication or there's been no editing or no kind of knitting them or sewing them together, then it's very difficult to make that book work. Um, and you can try as much as you want, but sometimes it just it just doesn't come together. If I could just make one comment on that. Um, this is a book that I'm the author of, and uh, I, in the original text, had talked about the passing of the seasons, and I had assumed that it would show four seasons, but the illustrator is from Cuba, and in the Caribbean, they don't have four seasons. And so we, we, once we got the illustrations, I changed the text um, to match her art, which I think is a, you know, for me, this is something that often happens as a writer, um, where, um, you know, I write the text first, and then it gets illustrated. And then I go back and we tweak the text in order to, you know, sometimes you might not need uh, as much text um, as, as there was before. So uh, this is something, you know, I mean, what Helen mentioned, I'm currently translating a graphic novel that is still being drawn. And there are some things where I know exactly what it says um, to do the translation, but without the pictures, I don't know the, the intensity or the tone that, you know, there's lots of different registers that I could be using in the scene. And without seeing the pictures, I'm not able to, you know, and so I flagged it, I said, this means this, but when we see the pictures, we, we're going to have to reevaluate this to see if we raise the tone or lower the tone. Um, and sorry for talking so much. The only thing I do want to add is that picture books are very multi-sensory or the experience of reading a picture book, because not only is it visual and the actual reading, sometimes it's a being read, read to or being read aloud and the actual turning of pages. And so all of these are very important elements in a picture book. And it's one of the things that I, I always, you know, suggest to translators, they must read their translation aloud, you know, things that work well on the page, you know, until you actually speak your translation, um, you can't decide that it's done, you know, because this is what, you know, adults will be doing with kids and kids themselves as they're learning to read, you know, that the, the oral aspect is, is an important part as well as, you know, the physical, the visual of, of the actual art and how the art and the text works, but also, you know, getting to turn pages in a book, you know, there's, there's so many elements. Yeah, thank you so much for those thoughts on the actual book itself and your focus on the pictures. We actually wanted to ask you about language specifically next, so um, shifting gears a bit to that, um, 
when we think about translations, we think about different languages um, and we think about moving from one language to another. So the students from the campus school of Smith College asked us, are some books translated into more than one language within the same book? Um, which is a really amazing question. And the answer is yes. Um, you can look to our C, trans, uh, C languages part of our exhibition um, to see some examples of those. We have a book called Daniel and Ismail, which has been translated from Spanish into three languages, which are Arabic, English, and Hebrew. There is another example um, called See and Say, a picture book in four languages, which are English, French, Italian, and Spanish. So thank you for pulling that up. Um, so we hope you check those books out and look for more multilingual books. Um, and our translators are welcome to list other examples um, if you would like to. I can think of two nice examples of books which also include um, uh, languages for um, visually or hearing impaired um, uh, children. And there's one that um, I um, helped to edit the translation of by Nadine Kadan, which is, um, um, uh, has um, some sign language in it. Um, and of course, if you're translating that um, from one territory to another, you might need to change the pictures. Even, you know, um, so one translation of a children's book won't necessarily be appropriate for all English language markets. And the same is true for, for books for older readers. Now, a certain amount of editing that that needs to happen to the text and possibly the pictures to, to make that to, for that localization it's often called in translation for the world like um, making that work in the local um, the local market um, and at the moment I'm translating a lovely book um, by a Russian author and illustrator team Anna Anastimova and Julia Sidnova which is um, about a, a blind girl and all of her limitless adventures um, and and that's got braille in the end in fact the final chapter is her, is her teaching her friend how to read braille and that's going to I'm, I'm a bit scared I don't even know <laughs> um, yeah, how much research I'm going to have to do for that but I'm really looking forward to um, working out what the difference is in the obviously the Russian alphabet is a different length that's not obvious but there are more letters in the Russian alphabet to English and um, uh, that may involve some re redoing the illustrations to, to make that work for English but I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge. Oh, I, um... Thank you. Some other thoughts we had on language were about the fact that translators will work um, from translating writing into one language, but then also in the other direction, working within those two languages, um, which Lawrence has worked in. Um, and so we were hoping to ask you specifically and then open up to everyone um, a bit about your relationship with self-translation compared to the work of other authors um, and what it means to translate into your first language um, versus translating into a learned language. Um. Sure, and um, I can jump into that since, you know, I was mentioned as someone who does translate in both directions and does write in both directions. And one thing tying back to the previous question about multilingual books is I think it's very different when you're creating a book with parallel text um, than if you're doing a translation of one monolingual edition to another monolingual edition. And so I've written a number of bilingual books. It doesn't matter what language I start in. I always, you know, once I do the self-translation for the other language, I always change the original, whatever I started in so that they both match. And so, but that's something that until you translate it, you don't know what's going to need to change until you have both of them um, sort of on the, on the table. Um, so I find that, um, you know, I, I, there are books, you know, this book, for instance, that I had shown earlier, this was the first time a book that I wrote in Spanish, which I jokingly call my lengua madrastra, my stepmother child, um, was translated into English by someone else. This was translated by Elisa Amado and published by Groundwood in Canada. Um, and it was fascinating to me, um, and helped me a lot in terms of being more, um, the ownership of my own translations that it helped separate that I'm just the author of this book and uh, Elisa Amado made her decisions as the translator and I might have made different decisions and that's fine you know I'm only the author of the book I'm not the translator and though this has helped me a lot in terms of when I'm translating other authors that I can you know consult them on things um, take into consideration their their preferences but um, the translation is mine and so 
you know, I, I, it, it has let me, you know, being translated into my mother tongue uh, has let me feel bolder about um, making these uh, decisions as a translator and sort of have more confidence in myself. So. I'll say that um, I would never, I only ever translate into English because I'm not really good enough to be able to translate into another language. Um, and I think in terms of the confidence, one of the things that was very nice for me was when an author I was working with, she was Chinese, she is Chinese, her husband was American. And um, she, she always spoke in terms of it's recreation, not translation, do what you like, it's okay. But she would pick out things, she, her English is good enough to be able to pick things out that she's not happy with, um, which was very nice. And perhaps the, the most wonderful thing that happened to me was she sent me, she'd written a, a sort of fictionalized autobiography, but she'd also written a very small piece which she published in a journal in China. And um, I'd kept it and I translated it. I sent it to her just before Christmas one year. And she must have sent it directly to her husband before she read it. Her husband then emailed me and said, you just sent me the most amazing Christmas present. I can't read my, wife, my wife's work, but I can read the English that you've just written. And it's exactly her. And that is, you know, one, it's a really nice compliment, but actually it's really wonderful to think you can do that for somebody. You can make somebody sound like they are, but in another language that somebody else can recognize them in. And I've never met either of them which was just, was that how do you, do, do they call each other dear or darling or sweetie or honey or what do they call each other? But they just, they were just so kind. And that was a fantastic boost to say, yes, you can do these things and they can, they can come back and, and suggest changes if they want. But on the whole, people are generally very, very, very happy to have their work put into another language. I will just make one comment to, to address what it's like self-translating different than translating someone else, which is that um, since I am both an author and a translator, that if I'm self-translating, it goes back to being on the working table. That is, it becomes a work in progress as opposed to translating something that is already finished when I'm translating someone else's book. And so it's a slightly different um, experience for me because it becomes more a new creation, uh, even though, translation is recreation, um, it, it, it stops being finished in a way um, because it, it, it goes back onto the working table. So it becomes like a draft that I'm then translating as opposed to uh, this is a finished work that I'm translating from one language to another with all the creativity that I can bring to it. But it's um, the, the finality of the original doesn't exist when you're self-translating, even if it's already been published. I think uh, arguably we should think like that or more like that about our translations anyway. I mean, in a funny way, I think what you're describing, Lawrence, is, is, is self-translation, but it's also how we might become a bit bolder in, in any translation. And I think particularly picture books where there are so many dimensions on which you're operating. And I think one of the problems we have is we kind of look at the, the, our source and go, this is finished and it's final and it's not up for negotiation. We can't change any of it. Um, and actually being able to look at it and go, you know what? There's a really interesting opportunity here, which requires changing it, but this language allows this new opportunity or this joke or whatever it may be. Um, and actually getting away from that sense that, this, that there is a version that has been fully crystallized um, and where there is no scope for change. Um, I kind of feel like I'd like, to, I'd like to translate more like the way you self-translate. I think that, you know, even translating other people, we can do that. And I think that, you know, for me, one of the liberating things was being translated into my mother tongue by other people. So um, I've learned that being more bold about things, um, I mean, just to give a, a, a quick example, this is um, Little You is with a board book um, by a, a pair of indigenous creators, Richard Van Camp and Julie Flett. Uh, the book is very careful never to gender the you it shows different indigenous families. Um, this is one of the books that I think is in the exhibit in Cree translation in a bilingual Cree and English edition. I translated the book into Spanish. One big problem of the way that the English and Spanish work differently, all diminutives in Spanish are gendered. And the book, because it was so careful not to use gender, I felt it was um, 
it was important that I didn't just use the masculine as neutral, which is what Spanish does. And so um, I, you know, when I did the translation, I did a, a simple translation that was faithful to the original text um, using masculine as the neutral. And then I did a rhyming version that maintained the, the gender neutrality of it, um, even though I had to take a lot of liberties. And that is the one that was finally published. So, I mean, we changed the title to uh, To What Is To, You Are You. So instead of Little You, um, but, you know, I had to add, um, you know, following the illustrations, making, you know, I made a rhyming gender neutral version in Spanish that took a lot more liberties. And as a result of those liberties was more faithful to the, the book. So, I mean, I think that, um, for me, it's important to always recreate the reading experience. So if a book rhymes in one language, it should be, you know, if a book is, has playful language, it should be playful. Uh, even if you can't keep the same jokes or rhymes or alliteration, you can recreate them in another place, um, you know, to recreate that reading experience. So, um, so, and I think that all of us do this. I mean, I know Danny, when you had that, you know, like after the storm and you had all the jokes that had to be redone and stuff, you know, I mean, you you change things and, you know, we, we do this with other people's texts, with our own texts, with, you know. I think very That's often, fine. sorry. Sorry, please. It's my little comment. Um, yeah, we tend to, um, to maybe translate and also editors think about editing. This book that stands alone and is not going to be compared to the original. So there, there is the liberty perhaps to, you know, to make it work in, in the new language make it an English book that's going to um, draw readers and take it from the shelf. But actually, I, I love the idea that more libraries could or should, more school classrooms could have books in both the original language and, and the translation to invite that conversation, which is, is happening in the Carl Museum, um, to invite kids to, to put, you know, if they've got the a, a heritage language in their family or they're learning a language at school, to just have that really basic experience of comparing two books and thinking, why has the translator done that? Why is this different? Because that's that's the sort of the start of a journey to analysing our assumptions about language and, and and what's similar, what's not, what's universal, what isn't. Um, so I think that it's just such a powerful, it's essentially very powerful tool in the in a multilingual family or in the classroom or the, the library. But I hope more more libraries take up the sort of the, the resources from this Carl Museum exhibition. Thank you. Um... We wanted to get to one more topic, so um, I'll move on to that. I think this might be the last thing we'll have time for, but on the flip side from the self-translation you were all touching on, um, we were wondering about collaborative translation um, and those students at the campus school of Smith College also asked us, are some books translated by more than one person? Um, and so I was hoping to toss it over to you, Helen, and ask, your thoughts on this because you do collaboratively translate or you have worked collaboratively collaboratively with other translators um, and we were wondering about that experience. Um, I have, but I haven't worked collaboratively with other translators on picture books. I've done it on novels for grown-ups. Um, the collaboration that I do mostly is with the editor and it's it doesn't just go from the, the author to the translator to there it is in the book and it's available. There is a process in the publishing house. The publishing house knows what they want. They will suggest or either very likely or very strongly things that maybe need to be changed or need to be um, adapted. And so it's always, always, always a collaboration with, with the editor before you actually get to the, the final version of the translation. Um, and I think Daniel, you, you recently highlighted the role of the editor in a prize to make sure that the editor, this, this fact is known and is, is acknowledged because the translator's name may get may or may not get on the book, but the editor's name almost never gets anywhere. Um. I can mention briefly, I've done some collaborative translation um, from languages that I don't speak fluently um, or sometimes that I don't speak at all. So I've done, um, a translation of a number of books from Latvian, very often working with, um, so the, there was a rhyming text in Latvian and I worked with Arvis Bigouz who did a literal translation into Spanish and I did a rhyming version of that in Spanish. And so Arvis and I are the co-translators um, of the book. Um, I would look up, you know, what, what, what had been the rhyme words, um, you know, cause what rhymed in, um, 
in in Latvian didn't rhyme in in Spanish very often. We had to make changes, you know, basing basing the final version off of what what worked to rhyme and what worked with the pictures. So you know, there were a lot of um, a lot of changes that happened that way. And it's one of the interesting things also that, you know, I've done this also sometimes using English as a bridge language um, and working from an inflected language, a language that has gender, like what I, I pointed out here, I need to know the gender of every, um, every person who's mentioned. So if it just says in the English bridge, it just says the teacher, I need to know, is this a male teacher, a female teacher, a non-binary teacher, uh, because those are all different words in Spanish. So if I'm translating into Spanish, so it's, it's one of the, the dangers of using English as a bridge language. Um, so, and oftentimes when I've done this, I, I almost always do this working directly with the authors. And so I worked with a Maltese author once and um, things that didn't quite work with English. I said, how would you say this in Italian? Because she speaks Italian and that was very close to the Spanish and that helped us um, find a good solution. Definitely, thank you for highlighting those different participants and people that go into making the book come into fruition. Um, I think that is the last question we'll have time to um, cover. So thank you so much for all of your answers and ideas on those. Um, we wanted to briefly talk about um, the absence of Ukrainian picture books in our exhibition. If we were curating it now, they would be present. Um, and Ruth, was going to share some books and from Ukraine as related to the messages of the exhibition and expanding that story. Thank you. Um, I didn't say earlier on, but it really is such an honor to have um, some of my translations included in the exhibition. And then even more an honor to be asked to um, talk about some Ukrainian books. Um, by no means an expert, but um, as a Russian speaker, I, I can read some Ukrainian and I've been um, collaborating with translators and um, publishers from Ukraine to, to try to, um, to help connect people, partly as a translator, but also as part of Well Kid Lit, um, this project, this community project, um, where we're trying to um, make connections and um, improve access to books which um, uh, from languages which haven't been so much translated. Um, so of the slides, um, if you go back, is this the first slide? Yeah, if you go to this slide, um, these are um, six picture books which have been translated from Ukrainian already. Um, I hope there's some more that I haven't come across yet, but these are um, the six that, that we know of so far. And one, um, Maya and her friends has just um, recently come out um, from uh, Ivonia, and I think they are um, directing all profits or possibly all proceeds from the book to um, humanitarian causes to support Ukrainians, um, which is fantastic. Four of those books are here, um, How War Changed Rondo and The Fall of the Three at the Bottom, um, are all by the same um, um, author and illustrator combo. Um, and they have a studio called uh, Grafka Studio um, and make absolutely fantastic books. So that first image that was um, just showing before, that's from um, the book Sound. Um, which is all about hearing, sound, how our hearing works. Um, we love this in our family because I have two boys who are hearing impaired and are uh, just fascinated by how acoustics work. And this is an incredible piece of translation because this is about white noise, about silence, but also about the noise of words around us. And all of these are individual words which are translated from Ukrainian to English um, for, the, for the English version. These, these um, books by... Um, a graphic studio, Romana and um, Andre Lisa, um have, have been sold to many, many languages. Um, if we move to this slide, please, thank you. Um, I wanted to show you some um, pictures from How War Changed Rondo, perhaps the most important Ukrainian children's book to read at the moment. Um, it was written um, quite soon after um, the um, breakout of the conflict in the East and annexation of the Crimea a few years ago, so after 2014. Of course, it remains as relevant. And um, now as ever. Um, it's, if you move through the pictures, you get a sense of um, this portrayal of war as scary, dark. But as you move through the book, the, the people in the town, Rondo, they find light and they find hope and work together. It's a lovely um, sense of collaboration and of, of trying to work together to, to, to reach light for, for 
but at the end of the book, everybody is scarred. Everything is scarred by war. It's not it, not without its impact, but it's, it's a hopeful and optimistic book. And the last few books I wanted to show you, and we'll just go quickly through them, are um, some which um, are still in Ukrainian or in Russian, as in the case of Andrei Sulkov's book, uh, because Ukraine is a multilingual country where books are published in those languages and also um, Tartar is spoken. Um, um, and, and at World Kid Lit on the community blog, um, next week we're going to have a, a post with um, recommendations of um, more books. So if any publishers want to go there and see what's, what's looking for um, a publisher, there's lots of these suggestions. Um, but these, um, this one and the next book are both by um, Andre Kurkov. I thought his name differently there, sorry, <laughs> because he's also published in German. Um, and um, he's very probably the most well-known Ukrainian author of adult fiction. Um, he's written dozens of books, but also a lot of children's books. These are very sweet. Um, if we go on, oh, this is the back of the hedgehog. Um, these are absolutely beautiful books by Katerina Mikhailovna and um, Oksana Bula about what um, the, the the trees and the life in the parks. We've also got um, this theme also have one about um, the forest, and they're just beautiful introduction to trees and nature. If we go through, there's a few more images. Um, and, and I personally love this combination of fiction and fact books, um, um, which we see a lot more in translation, I think, than perhaps books written originally in English. Um, and also by Oksana Bula, um, these, um, if we go through a few more slides, we see, um, just get a sense of the amazing illustrative style of this fantasy world of these sort of forest spirits. Um, we have a next couple of slides. Um, and there's a whole series of them. This, um, uh, and they're a bit like Pokemon of the Ukrainian wilderness. I love it. <laughs> These wonderful creatures. Um, this is another example of uh, Romanish and Anesiv's book. So there's still more of those to pick up. Um, and the reason I want to share this as well is that any communities of where, of course, you'll want to find more Ukrainian books now to support people who are arriving. Um, um, this, this is a great way to sort of um, find these books and, and put them on your in your school and library shelves. Um, this is a great history, so there's some wonderful non-fiction um, and just brilliant styles of illustration. So like I said, these, there'll be more details um, on Welcome It next um, week. And uh, yeah, we hope to see some of these coming out in English soon. Thank you. Yeah, just get through to the end. Thanks for giving me a moment to, to share this. And this is one that actually, I'm, um, or this is the last one I would like to give you after that. Um, uh, this one I've been working on a co-translation with um, with my uh, good friend and Ukrainian teacher, and we're doing chapter each and, and helping each other out with the, the language and editing, which has been a wonderful way of sort of mentoring um, and collaborating um, in terms of thinking about the English, but I'm also learning a lot of Ukrainian through it. And the final one, please, um, this is an incredible book by an artist, Olya um, Hrebenek, who has been keeping this um, uh, diary of illustrations from the war shelter. And I'm not sure if it's, I, I think it hasn't been published in book format in Ukraine because there's no possibility to, but it has already come out in, in Korean, the first language it's been put into a book format in, and it's sold out in the first day. So I really hope that um, publishers might get in touch with her via Instagram and we'll see this book in, in more languages. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that. I think that um, Courtney or Regina were going to step back in to bring us to the Q&A section. Um, but thank you so much for sharing those titles. I will just also show that this is the original Ukrainian and you can't quite see, but um, you know, all of that reign of words, you know, these would be, this is in Cyrillic. So uh, it's just, it's an amazing, uh, an amazing picture book, really using text and illustration. Uh, this has all been so wonderful. And, and I just want to share, we, thank you to all of, to Gussie and Regina, our panelists. There's so many wonderful books that you've all shared with us um, visually, but we have our, our guests who have been sharing links in the chat as well. So definitely take a look at that. We do have a couple questions. We, we might have a, few, a time for a little bit of them. Um, and this might kind of tie into to what was shared at the very beginning, but uh, one of our guests asked, this has been so wonderful. Could you talk about how you quote, break into this field of translation? Uh, 
Shall I go first? Um, uh, a very long time ago, I published some translations of short stories, but there was no payment, there was no nothing. So I had to go and earn a living. Then I had a family, and my family were old enough. Um, I then started translating again, again, short stories, essays, and completely by chance, I got, I translated a, a children's book, then another one. And then because there weren't very many people translating from Chinese to English at the time, I became the person who translates children's books from Chinese, which is given the small number that I've done, it's not a very big accolade, but that's the, it means that you, if you're lucky to be offered them, then you're lucky to be able to do them. There are a lot of books that are being published. The, the, the difficulty for me is that there aren't enough publishers. Um, so that's that's the tricky thing from my point of view. We've mentioned World Kidlet a lot. Uh, the World Kidlet website has a, a page of resources for translators, which has a lot of useful information about how to how to get into translation now. Um, you know, what I mean, I fell into translation by accident uh, in the early 90s. Literally, I was talking to a, an editor who um, is the editor who had, the translator who had been working on a graphic novel had a heart attack and passed away and he needed someone to you know take over the translation project and translate it in two weeks and I was available and you know it was, it was a sudden a complete accident I think a lot of us do wind up having um, a start or a first chance through accidents um, you can try and make accidents more easy to happen by um, <laughs> making yourselves adjacent to translation or publishing communities whether that's in person at you know someplace like uh, book Expo in the US or the London Book Fair in the UK or various other fairs. There's also a lot of online um, resources and communities and things like that. There's, uh, you know, for early career translators, there's the Emerging Translators Network or the ELTNA uh, for North America. Um, those are online listservs, which are very open and welcoming communities as well. You know, meeting other translators, um, not just in your combination, but in other combinations is also very important. You know, very often people will get uh, asked for something, but they don't do that particular combination, but they'll know someone who does either the inverse or, um, or works in that combination. So those are all, I think, some quick tips. <laughs> Great. Thank the you. only thing I'll add to that really, really quickly is that is, when Helen was saying there isn't there, there sort of isn't enough of it, um, one of the things that that a lot of us have to do is try and increase how much that work there is, rather than just hope that we get a sufficiently large share of the existing work. And part of that comes back to a question which someone else asked in the Q and A earlier about about our kind of role as advocates. And one of the things that we are, I think all is doing is reading things in our other languages and trying to bring them to the attention of publishers and. Um, persuading, cajoling, begging, bribing, doing whatever we can do to persuade publishers to, um, to, to publish things that they wouldn't otherwise have discovered. So not just being there in the service of the things they find, but helping to increase what they do by drawing books to their attention. And this is, this is something that um, perhaps our audience can do as well, is that if you, if you would like to see more translated books, buy them, go to bookshops and ask where, you know, do you have any, can you recommend them and become a nuisance and go to libraries and borrow them. Um, and just, if there is a demand, then perhaps there'll be more opportunities for us to have fun translating them for you. Yeah, I would say, I, I think it ties in, you know, I think there was an, a question of why aren't there more translated books? And, you know, in some levels it's um, monolingual editors who don't know how to evaluate a book in a language they don't speak. And so very often it, it falls to translators to do a lot of this advocacy, like Daniel mentioned, of, um, of you know, finding projects and pitching them to editors. Lots of times editors may love a book, um, but they just don't have access to it or don't know how to find it or don't know what it is. I think that um, we, we're focusing mostly on picture books. There's actually even less in middle grade and young adult um, because picture books because of the art, very often editors will fall in love with art not knowing anything about what the story is about aside from the visual narrative and decide to buy it based on the art, not on the text. And so picture books can get bought or are, are very often bought much more frequently because the art is gorgeous or something like that um, than it is for a young adult novel. Um, May I add something else? is that uh, this year, one of your 
your your honorees, the bridge honoree is Ajiao. He's from China. He's somebody who in the children's children's book world in China is known by absolutely everybody. Before the announcement was made that he was a bridge honoree, I had interviewed him and published an interview with him on the on our blog, which is Chinese Books for Young Readers. I'd also created a Wikipedia page for him, which he had seen, and he knows English well enough to say, yes, that's fine. Um, very happy with it. It was up there, it was on Wikipedia for about two days. Then it was removed on the grounds that it didn't have enough references. Part of the problem is that the references are in Chinese and there is almost next to nothing in English, which means that the Wikipedia editors don't like it, which also means that it's very difficult for me to add the, add the, the references in. And then, so it's now been through two refusals. If anybody in your, in your organization is a Wikipedia editor, please could you approve it and, uh, and let it go live? Because it's so frustrating and it's it's actually so difficult to you know to go back to him and say, well, where is it? Where is it? You know, we approved it, it's all fine, let it come on. Um, so it, it, it would be really great to have that if anybody can help. I mean, just talking about Wikipedia, you know, it may be a thing, and it's sort of that translators wind up having to do all this extra unpaid work in general, but you know, having a, a hackathon or or this could be a school project that I mean this could be something that students could do of making sure that Wikipedia pages add in the translators of books. You know, I mean, this is something that um, that information is very often left out um, of reviews and other things, but especially because Wikipedia is often used as the resource that people go to to find out, you know, the lack of translators, not just translators not having their own uh, pages as translators, but the, the lack of translators being credited on the Wikipedia pages um, is, a, is a problem, um, you know? And so, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, can be a project for uh, individuals, for schools, for, for things. Mm -hmm. I think this is also a factor in, or, or an obstacle for um, publishers in taking on books from beyond European languages, for example, because unless there is some information that they can, um, you know, yeah. to sort of browse or find out about authors, um, there needs to be somebody of, of, of writing about them in, in English for them um, uh, to sort of pull together an assessment about whether they want to take on an author. Um, and yeah, a lot of that comes from literary agents but um, who are representing those authors, but um, I think it can help us. There's more interviews with writers from, from Asia, from, um, yeah, from uh, beyond Europe um, in particular. Is, Do we have time for more questions? We're, we, we're wrapping up our time. Um, this has been so wonderful. And I'm just looking through the chat. Everyone has been just so excited to hear from all of you. And I think are, are leaving inspired on how we can support translations um, in, in children's literature. I want to thank all of you for joining us this, this afternoon. Uh, again, this, this has been recorded. So anyone that wasn't able to um, attend, please share the link with them. We'll have it on the Eric Carl Museum's YouTube page. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias.